1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we will finish our study of this chapter. Uh, as we kind of close out this month, next uh, week, we will focus on a uh, patriotic theme as we come into uh, the last Sunday of this month and begin that first week going into July. And uh, so we have been studying here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, looking at uh, these truths because of that being our memory verse this week or this month. And so we will finish out this section, this middle section of the chapter this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, notice verse number 4, we'll begin reading, and uh, let's start at verse number 1. Paul says there, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? And so, uh, prior to Father's Day, last week, playing Father's Day Sunday, we focused on dads and, and raising our families. And so, the week prior to that, we, we focused on these first three verses. And we said that Paul is kind of schooling them. He's saying, look, and, listen, uh, you've been preached to, you've been taught, you have doctrine, and yet you go back to the carnality side of things. You want to chase the things of this world. You want to allow the flesh to rise up rather than getting into the Word of God and, and grasping what the Word of God is teaching you and living that out. And so he, he tells them there, uh, I fed you with milk and not with meat because you're not able to bear it when you ought to be able to. And so for us as Christians, we ought to be getting into the Word of God every opportunity we have. We ought to desire to grow. And, and again, just watching um, Ryan run around this morning, if Ryan was still just a baby, just as big as he was when he was born, something would be wrong. If Ryan wasn't walking and trying to talk and Ryan wasn't winking at me with his little eyes, we would say, why is this kid not developing? Why hasn't he changed since he was a baby? But we see that process of growth. We see him running around. I look and I say, man, it's incredible that he's already walking. It's incredible how big he's getting. He's kind of stretching out and losing that belly. He's getting tall. And, and that's the process of a baby. And you and I as Christians, we have the opportunity and nothing more uh, precious than to see somebody get saved and come to know Christ and really begin that, that earnest growth. Uh, but we ought not to get satisfied and say, you know what, I grew a lot this year and I'm just kind of happy and satisfied. I don't think I need any more of God's word or, you know, I don't need the church or I don't really need my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage me and help me. A shame on us when we get to that point. We need the word of God. We need those that are around us to encourage us. And Paul's saying, get into it and stick with it. Grow, grow, grow. And so now we come into verse number four, and we'll see that it kind of leads us into this next section. He says in verse four, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? And so he, this is, I don't want to focus on verse four, uh, but I want us to understand what Paul's saying. As he leads out of this carnality and this carnal thinking, he's saying, it's not about who led you to the Lord. It's not about the pastor that you're under. It's not about what Bible college you went to. It's about Christ. And, and all we need to do is know and understand our part is to take the gospel to the world and allow God to give the increase, allow Christ to give the increase. And so he begins this next section with that thought. Verse number five, who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? What minister? By whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that gave the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another man buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how that he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you, Lord, now that as we come to this time in our service, we have the word of God that we can open in our laps, in black and white, in our English language, that we can see it for ourselves, we can read it for ourselves. Yet, Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to open our minds, to open our hearts, to be able to understand it. To get from it what you would have from us this morning. 
Lord, I pray that you'll simply use me as a minister in your hands to speak the word of God this morning, to give us exactly what it is that you have for us. Lord, I ask that you'll take away any distractions, that you'll clear our thoughts, clear our hearts, that we may focus on the word of God. May your Holy Spirit have free movement in our midst this morning. We give you the honor and glory, Lord, and it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I titled it Laborers Together, and I struggled this week with a title. I wanted to go with 123, 321, 123, 3, TO, 1. Uh, but we're just going to go with Laborers Together. It makes it simple for Anna when she posts it on YouTube. But I think you'll see my thought process. We're going to go one foundation, two types of ministry or reward, and that there are three laborers you, me, and Christ. And then we'll see as that gets pared down to you and me are one in Christ, and then we are one in Christ. And so it really comes down to the fact that as we look at one foundation, two types of ministry or reward, three of us laboring together, really three goes back to one. It's all about Christ. It's all about Christ receiving the honor and glory, and that we simply take the gospel to a lost and dying world. So notice number one this morning, one foundation, verse number 11. The Bible says, for other foundation can no man lay. That is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That was God's plan from the beginning of the world. God created man and woman. He put Adam and Eve in the garden. He chose to have fellowship with them. He wanted them to love him in the same way, with a perfect love. They had every tree of the garden, all the fruit that they could enjoy, except for that one over there. And they chose that one. You and I see that in our kids. We tell them, you can enjoy anything you want. You can run from the property, from the, from the street back. It's all yours. And where will we find them? On the other side of the white line. Well, that's our heart's desire. That's our natural bent is towards sin, towards that which we can't have. So God knew man would choose that, and God had to have a plan for eternity. And that was Jesus Christ, the one foundation. Every man must accept Christ as their Savior, or they'll never reach heaven. And so Paul simply is saying that here in verse number 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid. Jesus Christ already died on the cross. He shed his blood for you and I. He was buried and he rose again to give you and I eternal life. And that's the only way any man, woman, boy or girl will go to heaven. And Paul points that out. Plain and simple, that foundation which is laid is Jesus Christ. So Paul doesn't argue the point. He offers no explanation. He simply states the fact there's one foundation. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ only. I, I would say in that no one. No Muhammad, no idol, no statue, nothing else that I make, no religion, no Mary, no one else, Christ alone. Amen. But then it's, or Christ only, but then it's also Christ alone. It's not my good works, it's not my religion, it's not my tithing, it's not my baptism, it's my salvation alone. Everything else comes after that. By faith I trust Jesus Christ for salvation and my faith is in Christ alone. Nothing added, nothing taken away. Once I'm saved, then I begin the process of growth. Then I begin the process of, of doing out of love. Because Christ saved me unto good works. He then saved me because of, the Bible would tell us. Okay, Acts chapter 4, verse number 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. So Paul is simply laying out the facts. Here's what God says. Here is the one foundation in Jesus Christ. There is absolutely no other. There's another man in the Bible that tells us the same thing. A man better than the Apostle Paul, Jesus Christ himself. He says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So the way, the way to God the Father, the propitiation, the payment, the appeasement for our sins... Christ did that on the cross. He took our sins upon himself. He became sin that he might redeem you and I. He made the payment. He is our redeemer. He is the only way to God the Father. He says he is the truth. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so in my mind, I think two different things. I have the written word of God this morning, but I also have the living word of God. John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So Jesus Christ was the living Word who came to earth to reveal God to you and I, to die on the cross for our sins, and to give us eternal life. But He's also left us the written Word of God that tells me the same thing, so I can read it for myself. He's preserved it in my own language so that I can know what God expects of me, and so that I can take the Word of God and share it with someone else. 
Again, Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We need to take the word of God to people so that they can see their need in it, and so that they can realize there's an answer for their need, the one foundation of Jesus Christ. The word of God declares that Jesus is the only way to God the Father, and the only foundation for man to rest his soul upon. We sang the song again this morning, my faith has found a resting place, and it's not in device nor creed, I believe this. Well, I quote it. Is it the right one? Yeah, my faith. And, and so, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever living one. His wounds for me shall plead. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This ends my fear. And now I can find peace in Jesus Christ. A sinful soul I come to him. He shall never cast me out. God says, whosoever will come, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. That foundation has been laid, and, and God will give salvation to anyone who will cry out and will accept it. And then beyond that, we have the blessings of a God that is a great physician. My great, my great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me, his precious blood he shed. For me, his life he gave. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through His blood. So we have the one foundation. And when Christ comes and He tells us that, Jesus Christ is life. He says again in, uh, I would say, Romans 6.23, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The death, burial, and resurrection for you and me. John 10.10, 10, He says that the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life that you might have it more abundantly. So Jesus doesn't argue the fact either. Jesus doesn't offer an explanation, although we can look at verses that give us a lot more than just the simple facts. Here it is. There is no other foundation but Jesus Christ. Number one this morning, Jesus Christ is the one and only. Number two, look, there's two types of rewards and two types of ministry that we see uh, we can have. Once that foundation is laid, once I'm saved and I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I ought to begin to grow, as Paul was telling them in verses 1 through 3. And as I grow, I want to build on that foundation good things, hopefully. And we see here we have two options. There's six things that we can use, building materials. Verse number 12, now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, thereupon he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. And so I have two types of reward, or ministry building materials I can use. Gold, silver, or precious stones on one side. Hay, wood, and stubble, or wood, hay, and stubble on the other side. And so the gold, silver, and precious stone is that which will last. It's lasting. It'll have eternal value. It's not going to go away in the fire. It's not going to burn up. And on the other side, I can use wood, hay, and stubble, and it's going to burn up. And you understand the first three, that fire purifies them. I put gold in fire, and it purifies out the impurities. It burns out the impurities. They rise to the top. I scoop them off. And what I end up with after that process is pure gold. Silver is the same way. We, we burn it, we make it hot, we make it a liquid, we scoop off the impurities, and I have pure silver through the burning of the fire. Fire will burn off of precious stones, any type of impurities on the outside of it, and I'm left with something more pure. But if I put the wood in the fire, it consumes it. If I put wood, hay, or stubble in the fire, it consumes it. It's gone. And so what God is saying, I give you opportunity as a Christian to build on that foundation of salvation Gold, silver, precious stones, that which will last for eternity. Or you can build with junk. You can spend your time in vanity and, and emptiness and build something that maybe looks big. Because I'll tell you, on this side, I give you a little bit of gold. It looks small. You may not think it's worth much, but it's worth way more than if I give you a bell of hay on this side. Oh, that bell of hay looks big. It's impressive. When you're driving down the road and you've got a little nugget of gold in your hand, you may not even see it from the roadway. But it has much more immense value compared to this bell of hay that looks big. I might see it from a mile away as I'm driving down the road. I say, ah, oh, that farmer's got some bells of hay in the field. I can see them from a long way. We'll put them in the fire and they're gone in a second. So I can build. God gives me opportunity. It's like comparing a dollar bill with a $20 bill and a $100 bill. I was going to bring in, but I, Brother Dan wasn't here in time for me to get all this money from him. I was going to bring Monopoly money, but I think you can understand it. If I have a, a $1 bill, I have a $100 bill and a 20 let's say, and I lay them out here, you, 
you would fit the $100 bill every time. If I put 100 $1 bills and four to $5 bills, right, Mr. Four, five, four. <laughs> I have four $5 bills or five $20 bills, let me stay with it, and a, and a $100 bill. Each pile is equal. So if we understand that the piles are equal, I, I'll take any of the three. But if the piles aren't equal, I want the 100 but now let's say I put 100 one dollar bills, 100 twenty dollar bills, and 100 one hundred dollar bills. You see the immensity of the value. Although this pile is going to look huge when there's a hundred of them here, and there's only one there, and I might scoop it up because I see the amount of it, but the value is not there as it is in the one hundred dollar bill. And so we can build a ministry. We might have all the smoke and mirrors. It may look like a huge haystack. But in God's eyes, he says, you're wasting your time. It's vanity. You're not doing it the way I want to. You're not building with gold, silver, and precious stones. But God, it looks huge. It looks so good. Everybody thinks that's church. Got it going on because look how many cars are in the parking lot. God says, no, no, no. On this side, I have opportunity to build with gold, silver, and precious stones. And people say, man, that pastor down there, God, just give it up. No, God looks at it and he goes, I got some gold nuggets down there. I got some precious silver down there. I have some precious stones that one day I'm going to use. They may not look like much now, but they're investing in people, and it'll last the test of time. Because you see, it doesn't matter what I see. It doesn't matter what I think about it. It's going to be revealed in the fire. Right. Notice the next verse. Verse number 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. Well, it may look good to me. It may look good to you. I can use the smoke and mirrors and and make it look like more than it is or that it's less than, but God's going to reveal that it shall be manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So it's not just the ministry, but my individual life and your individual life the same. What are we building in our individual life? How am I building and investing in my family? How am I investing and building in, in those I see every day? Maybe my workmates. Maybe it's somebody at the store. What am I investing in? How am I spending my time? Do I talk about the football game? Sure, that may open the door. But is it so that I can build a relationship to share the gospel with them? Or is it simply to appease my mind because I made conversation with somebody today? And so our works will be tried by fire. The fire there is kind of, if you remember our Wednesday night service, we talked about the uh, smoking furnace that moved through, and then we saw the burning lamp. We thought, talked about it being one thing is the judgment of God, the all-seeing eye of God. And so here we see this fire. It is God that knows everything and that is going to judge those works. So none of us can hide what we do from the Lord. He knows it. He knows why we do what we do. And I think that's why in 1 Corinthians 10, just a five chapters, uh, nine, six chapters later, he says to us, whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, right? It's our king verse. Whatsoever ye do, do all to the Lord. Well, so then God's saying that even the minute things in life, my eating and my drinking, uh, maybe not the most important thing to God, but in my mind it should be important enough to me that I keep myself in tune with God. Whether I'm eating or drinking or I'm out witnessing, let everything I do be done to the glory of God that he may receive the honor and glory. It will be made manifest or known. It will be declared or stated, we see in this verse. All will be revealed as to the value. So God is interested in the quality, not the quantity. God wants the quality of my relationship. God wants the quality of what I'm building on the foundation, not just quantity. Notice verse 15, uh, the second part of it, is that our salvation will be tried by fire. He says, although what, no matter what happens to my works, even if my works are consumed or my works last, uh, God's going to look at my salvation. Is it based on Jesus Christ and Christ alone? And so it says that no matter what happens with my works, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So my works may be consumed, but if I have eternal life, if I place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I'm saved and I'm not losing it. My salvation I have or I don't have, and it's based on what God has given to me. The gift of God is eternal life. He offered it. I simply accepted it. I didn't work for it. I didn't earn it. I didn't do anything to gain it, so I can't lose it. Once he has given it to me, it's mine through faith and by grace. It's mine, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved, the offer of it, through faith I accept it, 
I'm saved. It's mine. I can't lose it because it's not in and of me. It's, it's Christ and Christ alone. My works, though, what I build on top of that foundation may be consumed, but I'm still saved. So I'll stand before God may be smelling stinky like smoke and with nothing left except for my salvation. Or he says, I give you the opportunity, instead of going before God having suffered loss, I give you the opportunity to go before God with reward. You know, on top of my salvation, I've built with some gold, silver, and precious stones, and now I can go before God with something to offer. Hopefully to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That I may throw those crowns back at his feet and say, thank you, Lord, for saving me. And because you did, I wanted to serve you with all my heart. And that's what we're going to see here in the next part with Paul. And so we have, number one, the foundation. Number two, the uh, opportunity, I believe, for ministry. The opportunity to build on that foundation is for you and I. And there's two things. Gold, silver, precious stones. Or we can grab all the hay, wood, and stubble that we can amass. It may look good, but it's worth nothing. Notice the third thing this morning. There are three labors, I believe, and... And we're going to break this down. We'll parse it down into uh, one. Notice verse number five. Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos but ministers? To by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that gave the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another, man, and another buildeth thereon. But I let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Now, all I want us to see in verse number 5 is that Paul says, he, he's coming out of verses 1 through 4, and he's got this carnal, carnal mindset that he's telling them, listen, get out of the flesh, get out of what's taking you away from what's important. Get, get out of what's taking you away from grounding yourself in the Word of God and beginning this growth process as a Christian. And so in verse number 4, he says, one of those fruits of carnality is that, well, I'm a, Pastor Paul's my pastor. Pastor Apollos is my pastor. Pastor Sam's my pastor. Who cares? Paul says in verse number 6, who cares about that? Or in verse number 5, he says, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? They simply preach. They simply expound on the Word of God. But God gives the increase. They're just ministers in the hands of God, verse number 6. But God gives the increase. They water and plant, and they are one in the service of God. But God, and so Paul repeats three times, but God, but God, but God gives the increase. And so he's simply pointing our eyes to get our eyes off of what is going on down here. Get our eyes off of what it is that is amassing and allow God to have the glory because nothing gets done outside of Christ doing it through us. And so Paul said, asks the question, who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? Don't put the, the, don't put the spotlight on me. Point it on Christ. I'm simply a tool in the hand of the master gardener. And so in this, we see number one is, or letter A under, under point number three is you, me, and Christ. Uh, we're all in this together as servants and, and with Christ. We're working alongside. He would tell us to get into the yoke. My yoke is easy. It's light. Get in and plow with me. Get to work. Let's get busy. But none of us can germinate the seed. None of us can germinate the seed. I might take the seed out of the packet and I stick it in the ground. And I might have my rows exactly perfect. And I may make sure that they aren't crooked. There's nothing wrong. There's no weeds. I've got all the rocks out. I've fertilized it. I've done all this. But I can't turn it into seed. I have nothing to do with what comes up from that. Christ does the work there. He allows the seed to die. And once the seed dies, he gives it new life. And once it has new life, he begins to oversee the growth. And I've simply been allowed to be part of that. And what an opportunity, what a blessing to simply be an opportunity, to have opportunity to serve and be part of it. And so Paul says that God does the germinating. God does the overseeing of the new growth. We're simply tools in the hand of the master. Paul says we need to realize what's important. Don't be carnally minded. Don't look on the pedigree. Look on what is going on. Don't be overly concerned with our grouping rather than getting to the Bible and getting it out to the lost and, the, and to grow in our process of, of our spiritual walk with God. Uh, I think of uh, some people that will argue over things. Uh, well, I went to this Baptist college and I went to that Baptist college. And so you see groups of churches with 
this is our pastor, and he came from this church, and we only allowed speakers from these colleges. And then you got this group with this college, and you got this group with this college. If they're preaching and teaching the word of God as it is faithfully, and I'm not saying we just call anybody in here and allow them in the pulpit, but if they're a faithful man of God that will be faithful to the word of God, I don't care what college they went to or didn't go to, if they're a man of God and will preach the word of God, we'll, we'll support them in that. And Paul's saying that. And Paul's not saying, hey, it's not important what's on your sign outside. We're an independent Baptist, King James Bible-believing church. And I think it's important that we are. Because somebody driving down the road wants to know, does that church believe the word of God? Do they stand where I do? Or am I going to be surprised when I come in on Sunday morning? But is that the most important thing? Is what's on my sign? It shouldn't be. It should be that we love everybody and we'll, we'll accept them and we're going to give them the word of God in truth and love. Right. Paul says the same thing. As he's saying here, it's not about me, it's not about Apollos. He still tells Timothy, you're my son in the faith, Timothy. I invested in you, Timothy. I poured myself into you and that opportunity you got is because I spent some time with you. So it's a balance in there. We have to be careful. We're not just going to allow anybody but we're also not going to shun somebody just because they didn't grow up in the same circle I did. Paul says number two in verses five and seven, we need to understand our place. There's three, you, me, and Christ. Now we're going to pare it down to two. You and me are one, and Christ is there. Verse number five, he says, who then is Paul and who's Apollos but ministers? By whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Verse 7, so that neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that gave the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. God's in heaven overseeing it all. Christ is seated at the right hand of God in heaven. He left you and I down here to do the work. How important is that work? And we ought to be about our Father's business. But whether I'm preaching this morning or I'm, a, I'm following up on something at the hospital where somebody else preached, or I'm following a missionary or an evangelist that has preached the word of God and I'm simply following up, we're one and the same. I might preach today and you might follow up with somebody in a conversation later. Somebody else might preach today and I have opportunity to run into them in the hospital and I follow up on it. But we're simply stewards. We're simply servants in the garden. Hey, let me pick that weed today. And you say, let me get that rock out of there. And we say, hey, we need to, it's time to freshen up the soil or put some more fertilizer Whatever it might be, our work down here is one, he's saying, and Christ oversees it. If we're faithful in the garden to keep the rocks and the weeds and the things out that, that is our responsibility, God will give the increase. I think of it in, in the sense of a minister, in the sense of a tool. I might be a rake today that God comes to the garden and he grabs the rake and he starts to rake. You might be the shears that he picks off the shelf and starts to shear with. We miss the tool that God uses and he puts us in places. I've told you before, I might see the chief of police on Monday morning. You won't. But I can tell him I'm praying for him. But I will never see your boss on Monday morning. But you can. And so today, I'm the rake in this garden. While you're the rake in this garden. And God wants us to be faithful where he's placed us. Be the tool that he needs at the moment. Hey, you see that guy over there? Go talk to him. I'm the one that's there. It's my job. Be the, be the tool in the hand of the master. We're saved. We're servants. Laborers in the field and somebody you know what I'm talking about. Most of us in Florida know what we're talking about. You'll see the laborers out there picking oranges. Nobody wants to be the laborer. Nobody thinks much of the laborers. Well, there they are. Bright and early in the morning out in the field. They'll be there till 5 o'clock. When I'm driving home in my air conditioned car, they're still out there working. We are called to be laborers in the field of our Savior. The Savior of our Savior. And he says the problem is the fields are white on the harvest, but the laborers are few. Because most of us don't want to spend the 12 hours out in the sun, out in service for our Lord. And yet he says you're a, man, you're a tool, you're a minister, you're a servant, you're a laborer in the field of God. And unfortunately, the laborers are few. They're nobodies in the eyes of most people, yet their, their faithfulness is required for the harvest of men. So every time you beat, bite, you, every time you peel an orange and you bite into it, every time you take a fresh apple or you take some fresh grapes and you throw them in your mouth and you think, man, that's refreshing. Yeah. Reminder, we need to be out in the field harvesting. Right. 
because somebody will find it refreshing when they come to meet the master because you and I were simply faithful in the field. God uses you and I to get the gospel and good news to the lost around us. I'd rather be doing what God wants me to do than on my own doing my own thing. I'd rather be faithful to God than to be carnal, although there is pleasure in sin for a season. Notice verse number 8 again. Now it pairs it down to you and me. We're one in Christ. Verse 8 and, and 9. He says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. We are laborers together with God. So now we're, what we did was go from three to two to one. And that's where I was saying I'm struggling with the title. One foundation, two types of ministry or reward, three labors in the field. But those three go to two to one. We've paired it down to all that I do I have to reflect glory to God. Yes, I may be the rake today. Yes, I may be picking stones today. But it all goes back to the glory of God. Each has to do our own part. And we understand from verse number eight, he says there, that every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. So this goes takes us back over to the other verses in verse 14 and 15. That in my labor I can receive reward. Or in my labor I can receive or suffer loss is what he's saying. And so Paul takes us to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Keep your finger here though. We'll come right back. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Verse 9, Paul says here, I am the least of the apostles, but I'm not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul, Paul says, look, I'm, I'm saved. I'm not only am I saved, but God has made me an apostle. He's made me a minister. He's allowed me to take the gospel to the world around me. And the last thing I deserve is to even be saved, but to be given an opportunity to be a servant, to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I don't meet the standards, but... Verse number 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Paul says, I don't deserve to be saved, but because God reached out to me in my sinful state, as I'm persecuting the church of God, as I'm frothing with anger, I've got the papers in my hand, the arrest warrants for anybody that's a Christian, man, woman, boy, or girl, I'm going to torture them and kill them. I'm going to do whatever it takes to eradicate Christianity. Christ put me on my face, on the ground, and he revealed himself to me, and I was saved. And because of that, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And now I'm going to serve him with all my heart. I'm going to serve him with a fervency. I'm going to give him everything I've got. I'm going to be the best tool in the garden. I'm going to be the best servant out there. I'm going to be the best laborer God has ever had. And that's Paul's testimony here. He says he, he did not bestow his grace in vain. What he showed me grace, I received his grace, and I turned it into a zeal for serving God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Again, I'm saved by faith through grace. And that alone is not by works lest any man should boast. But verse number 10 tells us, I am then saved unto good works. And too many of us as Christians, we just get happy. We're, I'm saved. <laughs> I'm never going to hell. I've got to get it. Yeah, that's true. But unfortunately, that's not God's fault. God wants us to say, man, God saved me from myself. God saved me from my sins. God saved me from who I could be. Romans 1, Sick, perverted, chasing my own wishes. A life without God? Oh, He saved me from all of that? Man, the least I can do is be faithful in the garden God's put me in. This isn't also, we see, uh, go back to 1 Corinthians 3. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Uh, this isn't socialism. God doesn't teach socialism. God teaches that we all put forth effort. That He saved me. And He expects me, because I'm saved, to serve Him with a zeal. He saved you. And you. So he expects you to serve him with zeal out of a heart of love. I can't crank your arm and make you love God as much as I want to. You know why? Because God doesn't crank your arm and make you love him the way he wants to. God doesn't crank your arm and make you get saved. He simply says, here's the gift of eternal life. Will you accept it or reject it? We have the choice to accept or say no thank you. Once I'm saved and I possess salvation, now God says, won't you out of a heart of love because I so loved you, won't you just serve me? The harvest is plenty, but I need some laborers. Will you sign up to labor? And we say, yeah, yeah, I'm, 
busy. I'll get back with you later. But let me think about it for a little while. Three, five, ten, fifteen years later, we're still not serving God. And God's saying, you've got a few years left, will you serve me? It's up to us. Why not jump in today? Why not sign the contract and say, God, here am I. Send me. God, I'm in a Kobe Florida, but I'll be the most faithful person in a Kobe Florida you've ever seen. I'll be the faithful witness you need, wherever it is, city of Orlando, um, wherever. God, I'm your man. God, I'm your woman. God, I'm the teenager you're looking for today. God, I'm yours. Use me. So Paul says, I work harder than they all. Sometimes, again, we go back to the thought I preach. Sometimes I follow up and vice versa. But God does it all. Sometimes you may be the one that shares the gospel. Sometimes you might be the one that answers the question, hey, I got a track from somebody at your church this week, and I just had a couple questions I wanted to ask you. You may plant, you may water. You may be the one that moves a rock or pulls a weed. But God will give the increase if you and I would simply be faithful to be what God has called us to do. So one, two, three, three, two, one, however you want to put it, let's labor together for Christ. All starts with one foundation, and all ends with Christ being all in all. So we start with one, Christ. We end with one, Christ. It's all about Him. We're simply laborers. We simply have opportunity. What a blessing. We get able to serve the human being. Anything that comes out of our gospel outreach and discipleship efforts is really of Christ. He gives the increase. We need to be faithful to labor. So let's labor together with Christ, seeking to keep Him preeminent, to, return, to earn eternal rewards that will stand the test of time and to point as many as we can to the one true foundation, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if your faith is found a resting place in Jesus Christ, why not share with others how their faith can find a resting place? Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you.